Davis, to whom I've referred before, who's the choir director at the Ogden Dunes Church, once told me, he says, never, never get up and apologize before a sermon. Okay. But I'm going to offer kind of a half-hearted one, not half-hearted, a very sincere apology, but uh, my text as I ended up today would take us till Tuesday. <laughs> and yet the message I want to offer is a fairly simple one. Now, my, my, my excuse for, for having some awkwardness in, in, in writing this sermon is that the time that I do not spend as pastor uh, was supposed to be spent playing golf. But instead, I got involved, as some of you know, is for the last two years, I have been the, the chairman of the board of directors of Arizona Opera. And while during the summer, that's normally dead time. Uh, it hasn't been so this summer. I, I think I referred a few weeks ago to, to a conflict, but, but, but this week, the uh, past eight or nine days in particular, have been filled with phone calls and interruptions, all relating to a resume. And the reason I want to discuss this is because it suggested to me a fundamental issue which we as, as Christians should not have to worry about. Man, this is getting worn out. Um, Resumes. You know, I've been 49 years in business and, and, and ministry, and I've read a lot of resumes in my life. And I've read a lot of them in my role as a, as a pastor, a, a part of the commission on ministry of two different presbyteries. A resume, as most of you know, most of you repaired them, it will say such things as, you know, I attended such and such high school and graduated in this year, or I went to this and that college and I got a degree in such and such in this year. Um, I worked in this job for blah, 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 blah. In other words, items that are, that are factual and can be verified. But somewhere along the line, there was some advice that, wait, don't, don't, don't write resumes that way. Uh, say, you know, I achieved a sales increase of 3,000% of, 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 uh, or, you know, I managed to improve the efficiency of, of the place I work by, you know, some astounding number. Um, Things that I would call puffery, self-puffery. Uh, and, and, and while I, it isn't that people are lined up to become members of the board of directors <coughs> of the Arizona Opera, this past week I encountered a resume that was this self-puffery. Now there are some who thought that I engaged in a bit of self-puffery when I applied for this position here. Um, <coughs> and stated that I had negotiated the end of the Vietnam War and, and, and had cured several forms of cancer. Uh, a little bit of exaggeration. But in dealing with, with one such resume this week for the, the, shall we say, the completely unimportant position that was involved, it got me to wondering this. What is it, and I think I, I at least have a theory, that would lead us to try to present to people someone other than who we are? Now, you might be thinking, John, you're supposed to be giving a Bible-based sermon, not an Oprah Winfrey rerun. But I think one of the fundamental issues indeed here is biblical. We do not realize, even though we show up, that we have all that we need. That we do not wor need to worry about being acceptable to other people. Because we are acceptable to the one to whom it most matters. We are beloved children of God. We have all that we need. The truth is, though, I, and, and I, I, I'm going to give early a, a digression that I'd like to make, and, and I apologize for something in that at least twice a year I like to make this point. Statistically, one out of four of us here today suffers or has suffered from what the medical profession will call depression. And depending on how severe that depression may be, one cannot believe that one can be loved. In other words, it's, I, it, it, it's, it's a message that, no, no, I'm not worthy of being loved. And a 
a challenge a challenge for a pastor is to say ha but you are but you are and so what i'm really trying to deal with today is that we accept that whether or not a board of directors or a college or a boss in business might choose to accept us for a position that we have the most important acceptance that there is and an acceptance that can allow us to go and exist and exist and exist and it is not through any merit of our own that we have this but simply from the fact that we are children of I, I, I was reading this, 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 this resume. This is all inspired by, by, by my being turned off by a resume that had no detail, you know, other than part of the Red Sea. Okay. And in preparing today's sermon, which I'm more or less giving, but not quite, I realize it's because people like I are going to react negatively to a resume that people might feel that, well, I've got to make it look this way or that. But no, we have what we need, and yes, it is biblical. I, uh, I love the story, the stories of Elijah. And to be honest, in what I prepared, I, I had this out of context. I mean, it's a really gruesome story that precedes, I mean, Elijah kills a lot of non-Jewish prophets uh, in the story before what we read today. But notice, God provides. What Elijah needed, God provides. They call it a cake. I, uh, probably wasn't chocolate, but they, well, God provides a cake. I wish they'd use the word bread. Because it would be more clear that the Elijah story, that way, ties into the story of the Exodus. Which is ties into the gospel reading we had today. God provides the bread, what we need for earthly life. But Jesus then explains something more. You know, I, um, the, Jesus says, I'm not providing you goo that grows on plants, which is what the manna was in the story of the Exodus. I'm providing you something else. And what is it? I think it is that that message that it isn't that all we need is bread and it isn't that all we need is love because we do need the our own acceptance of God's love John this is you know this this is this is not a very meaty sermon um, to eat meat you've got to chew and digest and some of us maybe don't quite digest that God is love. That we are important not because of what degrees we have, what jobs we held. We are important because we are children of God. Accept it. Don't, don't ask for more. And as I say, as I, as I, was, as I pre was preparing the sermon, I realized that, that I'm, I'm going to make two points, okay? First point is, accept it. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks of you. Know that you are accepted by the one whose acceptance and love most matters. God himself through Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental. And if that's too soft and gooey, I'm sorry. But that is really the message that I want to deliver to everybody inside and outside the walls. I wish Laura were here to be my foil today. Okay, bless her heart. I hope she's having safe travels. Um, Laura, for those of you who don't know her, says, wants me to preach more against sin. Okay. Um, first, there are limits to my hypocrisy. Okay. Uh, and second, I think the message we have very clearly gotten from the story of David is that God loves us whether we're sinners or not. Okay? And that's the message I want to get out, is God loves us whether we're sinners or not. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is 
Wait, if God loves me solely because I'm a child of God, what about those other people? Guess what? They're children of God too. And just as we worry about ourselves being accepted by others, maybe we can help their lives by being accepting of them. Maybe the way they're going to be able to digest the good news that they are loved by God is for us always to reflect to them that we value them as children of God. And th three things. Okay. Three things. Um, Monty Python fans don't want me to stop with the parrot sketch from what? Oh, you missed it last week. I showed the parrot sketch. The whole thing? The whole thing. Wow. <laughs> so, two things. Three things. Three things. Three things. Is it not up to us as individual Christians, and it is, is it not up to us collectively as Christ's church to be carrying that message of acceptance to all those people who do not yet know Jesus Christ? And that's very biblical. The Great Commission is to go out and make disciples of all nations. So, as the, you know, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, it's true. But, but too often, nobody expects Christians to be Christian. And so it's up to us to go out and show acceptance and the love of God to those who don't know it. Um, it's simple, isn't it? It doesn't sound very biblical. You're used to hearing me speak Greek and Hebrew. But you know what's interesting? Karl Barth was one of the greatest theologians <coughs> of the 20th century. One can argue whether Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Goldman uh, uh, were, 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 were greater or whatever, it doesn't matter. Karl Barth, when he was somebody who was sitting in, in his library full of books, and says, Dr. Barth, what have you learned from your decades of, of study of theology? You know the answer. He opens up and says, Jesus loves me, this I know. Our religion isn't simple. It is simple to state. But it isn't always easy, especially for those who do have depression, like to accept that our religion is all about that God indeed loves us. That is the message of Jesus Christ. Maybe we can't put that on a resume, but it beats any... It beats any compensation we can get from, from any job there is. So friends, believe the good news. You are beloved children of God. And not just you, but every human being that you encounter. Let us show that message in how we live and not only in what we say. In Jesus' name, amen.